Hi, everyone. I have a confession to make. I'm a recovering Olympian. Are there any other Olympians in the room? <laughs> Doesn't come as too much of a surprise. But I'm 25 years after, I'm still recovering after having spent most of my life in professional sports. What I do today is entirely different, but also not. Because I'm an agile coach, and I design and I create teams that are high performing. And I believe that I'm qualified to do this because I have been part of high performance teams. I represented Austria in the 1992 Olympics, and uh, I played handball. Anyone have any idea at all what handball is? Wow, amazing. It won't spare you from watching a little video later on anyway. But good that you know. I played handball in the Olympics, and uh, then at some point I realized I had to grow up. And when I did, I started working with companies like these. Most of those are in the Southern Hemisphere, because I live in New Zealand. But some of them you might have heard of, such as Sony Ericsson or Weta Digital. This is not cricket. <laughs> this is handball. And um, while it's widely unknown, probably in India, but also in the UK, the US, basically any country that speaks English don't play handball. It's the second largest sport in Europe, right after football. And people have professional leagues. We have professional players. And uh, you can make quite a good living playing handball. For all of those who don't know yet what handball is, I want to play you a video which is about a minute and 30 seconds. Enjoy. Do you feel like playing now? Yes. It's great fun, by the way. But if you do want to do professional sports, it's really important to start at an early age. This is me doing sprint resistance training when I was very young. Also, my parents realized that it's really important <coughs> to stretch and to be tall when you want to play handball. It kind of worked out. Yep. Could be a bit darker, but that's me and my dad and my grandparents. I grew up being a complete sports geek. It was what I did, it's what I loved doing, and what I did every single day when I got home from school. And I think having been a sports geek makes, me, makes it easier for me to relate to software development geeks. And I found a community where I thought people are actually quite similar. They're like totally into one thing, and they love what they're doing, and it's their lives. And we all lack social skills, that's another thing. <laughs> And my idea of a perfect holiday at the time was touring Europe and uh, playing at youth tournaments. It was really, really cool. 
And one of the things it has done to me was very early on, it instilled a sense of joy, of achievement. I love being good at something. I love the element of mastery. And I love, let's face it, winning. It's pretty cool. And that's something I've kept all my life. What I haven't kept is the pink juicy. <laughs> but it was the 80s. It's my excuse. And everything I have achieved at any age, I have achieved as part of a team. There's no such thing as a single athlete achieving things on their own. And there's achieving things as a team. You're part of a team, but you still have to achieve mastery in your own right. And what, and what you need to do in order to achieve mastery is like in software development, you need to become a professional. And that's exactly what I did when I turned 17. This is what they do to you when they ask you to pose for a photo for those little signature cards. You're definitely not allowed to smile. But when I turned 17, handball really became my life. When you play handball, you train twice a day. You don't do this as a side job. This is your job. This is my first team, Hupo Nido yesterday, in 1986. We were a three-time European champion. We played in the European Champions League. And one of the things I learned very early on is that professional sports is an exercise in pain management. As I said, you practice twice a day. And I don't know if any of you have done this, but you do uphill sprints until you vomit. And, you do, and then you do five more. It's all doable, by the way. But what has, it has taught me is that whatever pain I felt in companies I work with today, it's not that different. Sometimes I'm facing the pain of a startup where we really don't know, are we going to have jobs tomorrow? This is all going to end in a month because we run out of money. And sometimes I face the pain of bureaucracy, of going at a speed that I perceive as being really, really slow. And playing handball has taught me how to manage that pain. And also like software development, professional sports has a big fat lie. What for us in software development is phase two, in professional sports is active relaxation. There is no such thing. It's what they tell you when you're supposed to take a day off. They chase you up a mountain to increase your red blood cell count. And really, it's nothing to do with that relaxation very much like phase two in software development that actually never happens. So all of this pain got me ultimately was to the Olympic Games, to Barcelona in 1992. And sticking with the pain, we had the saying of no pain, no Spain. <laughs> we came in fifth. And I've got to say, thank God, because the worst thing to possibly happen would have been coming in number four. I'm also the only person ever who regretted not getting a tattoo. Unfortunately, this is not my shoulder and this is not my tattoo. Everyone else seemed to have got a tattoo, but I didn't and I still regret it. What I got instead was a number of life lessons, a number of things that I learn and can apply now. And it's also a number of things where I needed to have 20, 25 years to pass before I could put them into perspective, because before I could manage to make things and understand how things related to each other. And I want to share with you the six key learnings that I got out of being a professional athlete. I also forget to, uh, forgot to ask, so anyone who, even though they haven't been to the Olympics, has been a professional athlete before? Amateur level? What do you guys play? Badminton. Badminton, nice. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Cricket. Oh, finally. <laughs> cool. And I think the most important thing that I have learned, and maybe all of you who have done team sports before can recognize this, the most important thing I have learned is how to pick my team. How you pick your team is incredibly important. 
And the one thing that I want to recommend is to choose a team where you are the worst player on the best team that will st still take you. Why? You learn a lot. Yes, exactly. That's the way you learn. You learn from other people who are better than you. Really good teams have the best coaches. And also, you learn how to normalize high performance. You don't wake up every morning and, and think, oh my God, I'm going to the Olympics. Oh my God, I'm a pro. Because all of your friends, all of your mates are doing the same thing. They're going to the Olympics too. So, and they're all really, really good at doing sports. So what you learn is to completely normalize high performance. And let me just tell you, it's not fun. For me, definitely was not fun. Because I had picked the best team that would still take me. I was 16, and I was playing with people who I absolutely couldn't relate to. I wasn't even sure whether I was supposed to use the formal or informal you with people who were as ancient as 25. But what you get when you stick, stick with it, when you go through this really, really hard part where you're just the worst person on the team, is ultimately success. And I can only recommend doing the same thing in professional life. I believe it is really, really important to pick the right company, to pick on a high level the team of a company where you can learn as much as possible. And even within your workplace, to pick a team where you can learn as much as you possibly can. If you're lucky enough to be allowed to choose your own team, there are three questions I usually ask people when they can. It's, what can I learn? What can I teach? And also, is this fair to my company? And if you get to a point where you can't find a place where you can learn, I believe it's time to find a different team or a different company. If you're not lucky enough to choose your own team, I've written a how-to instruction guide for how to introduce self-selection into organizations. Have any of you been at my talk on Tuesday? Cool. I hope you're going to self-select very soon. And I still do this today, picking my team, and even though I'm a self-employed consultant, I still need a team, I still need a group of people to learn from. And that's what I've learned to do in an informal way. I pick a team of people, an international group of people, who I bounce off ideas with. I go to conferences and I make those connections so I can discuss ideas and concepts with people. Just a quick question, how, how do you guys pick your teams or companies? What criteria do you use? So is the person willing to learn or are they and are they an optimist? Is that for when you choose your own team or is that when you choose other people to be on your team? Yes. Do you uh, when you choose your own team, like which team you want your company? What do you choose it by? Yes. <laughs> Challenges, yes. Which is pretty much the picking the best team that will still accept you. And speaking of, sorry. Do you have more than one company in Bangalore? So I think if you apply it to a higher level of abstraction, you probably do have a choice. Yeah. 
I think we all have an influence in making this happen by using criteria for how to cho choose the companies we work for and helping the companies we work for getting to a stage where people can choose their own teams. And another thing I've learned is that it's actually really important to know when to go. There seems to be this thing that people feel bad about leaving a team or leaving a company. We all feel that we're letting other people down when we do this. or We feel we don't have a choice. I believe the moment we have outgrown a team, we need to decide that we're going to leave. It's nothing, we should not ditch a team from one minute to the next. But it's a process when you realize that you can't learn on this team or in this company anymore to look for a different place. And I believe that's actually okay because we're responsible to keep learning throughout our professional lives. And we do this by picking the right teams with the right coaches. I also believe that collaboration is key which is absolutely nothing new that I'm telling you there. I'm also telling you nothing new, telling you that it's really, really hard. What I found interesting, though, is that in professional sports, you have a meritocracy. People are chosen 100% because of their talent and their skill, because of their performance. And when you've got this, you get a collection of people with very different backgrounds. You get people here from different classes of society people with kind of different cultures, people who have different backgrounds and different levels of education, different levels of intelligence. Lots of athletes are actually quite dumb. But you need to work with all of those and you need to make sure that you can establish a relationship with people so you can work together. In professional life, this is the same. By the way, this is what you do when you can't find a good picture, always use cats. <laughs> In professional life, that's the same. And I'm not sure what your diversity stats are, but I used to work in Amsterdam. 45% of the uh, population in Amsterdam are not born in the Netherlands. In Auckland, where I live at the moment, I think it's 41%. Any stats for here? Ninety percent volume, yeah, 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 and maybe and there's different kinds of diversity, but I do think that in a tech industry, if I compare this to professional sports and see how a goal and high performance results in people being really really diverse on a team, and then the tech industry, well we're actually not particularly diverse. It tells me that most likely we're missing out on a large group of talent. And we need to be better at looking for that. And there's one thing that usually people talk about, how great it is at startups, how great it is at work, because people are friends. I don't think there's anything bad about being friends at work. But I do believe it's absolutely not necessary to be friends. I've played handball with people who I didn't like. I have played with people who had very different values from. People I thought were boring, people who were homophobe, people I would not have grabbed a coffee with normally. But all I needed was being sure that that person is the best left wing in the world. I don't care whether I like them or not. I want to play with them because together we want to win. And there's research to back this up. Have you guys heard of Project Aristotle done by Google? Some of you. It's a four or five year old analysis, or it's the analysis of data over four or five years, uh, where they look at what makes teams high performing and is there any way to predict high performance. Turns out there isn't. The only thing where you, how you can, uh, the only thing that's a prerequisite for high performance is safety. It's but making sure that you have a shared goal and that you can achieve success together, that when you make a mistake, you cover each other's backs. That's the one and only thing. And I think that goes very well for sports teams. Sports teams, in a way, have it easier because if you've got a very diverse group of people who don't necessarily like each other but are 
the best, or want to be the best. You need to make sure they have a reason to actually collaborate. And that reason is a really, really compelling goal. In sports, those are dreams. You want to go to the Olympics. You want to be that person with the Olympic torch. And that helps you overcome any problems caused by diversity. By the way, I did this, the right smoke, it kills you almost. But, and also in professional lives, we need to find compelling goals that makes people want to live, live to, get, uh, to, live, to work together. And when we do have that, a diverse group of people who are highly talented, a, pe a group of people with a goal that is really compelling, we also need to have working agreements to make sure that we have an agreement how we can work together and achieve success together. And there's a book by Bob Sutton that's called The No Arsenal Rule. And I like it because basically what it states is that if you've got one person who's not a team player on your team, the cost is enormous. And it's actually so big that he makes a really good case that you should get rid of that person. We see this in sports. In sports, that's the player who doesn't pass the ball, who's going for his or her own goal. At work, that's the person who hides information. It's the person, it's the developer who refuses to test. It's the BA who refuses to learn something new. And when we see this kind of behavior, we need to get people to change it. And ultimately, if we can't, we need to get rid of them because the cost of the entire group of having one person not pulling in the same direction is enormous. I also believe we need to get really, really good at feedback because you get this group of people and they're really diverse. They need to find a way to talk to each other. And by getting good at feedback, I mean both giving and receiving feedback. Both are hugely important. On a professional sports field, there are two types of feedback. There's instant feedback, it's feedback on the field. If you're on the field, you need to have feedback right here and right now. If I'm in full sprint in this direction and the third time the ball comes here behind me, I need to shout at my colleague that I need the ball over there. There's nothing personal in it, but it's something they need to know right here, right now. There's no point waiting until half time. There's no point waiting until after the game. And also, it can't matter whether this person is junior or senior. This is something that just needs to happen. But then there's also the other kind of feedback. And that's the delayed feedback. That's the feedback off the field. Because sometimes you can actually wait because it's not an emergency. You can wait until you give feedback in private. I call it on a team having no undiscussables, where you can really talk about problems and over time solve them. Personally, I, was, I remember being about 18 or 19, and I thought it was a really good idea to slack off a bit and go out about town, town and get pretty drunk and have fun. And I thought this was just my problem, until an older player took me aside and said, hey, you might think this is your problem, but really, this affects all of us. When you go out and drink, and you're not ready for practice in the morning, this is not just your problem, this is our problem. And that's what I want to get to with any type of team, that we can have those discussions around what's okay and what's not okay, is said. No undiscussables within a team. And I found this really cool framework for giving feedback. Who of you are familiar with radical candor? So, it's a framework that's um, made by Meryl Scott. She has been, um, and she has received feedback. And out of that, she has come up with a framework based on her personal experiences. And basically, there are two axes on feedback. One is behavior where Something needs feedback, and you can either challenge directly, or you can back off and not challenge at all. And then there's the other dimension, 
which is how much do you care personally. You can care a lot, or you can actually not give a damn about that person. And I really, really like that framework because there's so many techniques around giving feedback. But I think what it comes down to is what's the place that feedback is coming from. And the place it should come from is radical candor, where you care deeply about that person and you also bring things up directly. Be careful to question yourself, or I always question myself before I give feedback. Am I just annoyed and actually don't care that much about the person? That would put me into the obnoxious aggression category. And sometimes I find that um, people care, but they don't really dare to give feedback. And I had a really interesting experience a couple of months ago when I asked some friends to come and give us feedback because there are a couple of people in my company. We want to be better at public speaking. I'd love to get keynotes. And I asked them, so what do I need to do? And they told me, well, it's a little thing here and a little thing there, but that's all they said. But I also got the feedback that if I want to do keynotes, I need to change my accent because that person really didn't understand what I was saying. And I thought, that's an amazing data point. This is really cool to know. And it is like a professional athlete getting to know that actually you need to play more of a topspin. And the problem with that feedback was I didn't get it. They sent this in an email to my business partner. And I think there's so much damage done by having this ruinous empathy, trying to protect my feelings, which is actually really unfair because I can't improve. And I'm not sure about your culture, but in a New Zealand culture, in a Southern Hemisphere culture, we're very often in the we're too polite corner where we don't say what we really think because we're trying to protect other people's feelings. And while I'm at feedback, receiving feedback, it's equally important to consider the source. Because some people, in professional sports, we pay professional coaches and we listen to them. We also listen to our teammates. But also, there are people we don't listen to. I don't necessarily listen to a sponsor or the, or, um, the audience in a handball game. I know. Also, if you had any advice for me, on how to throw the ball better. I really like you, but actually, I would just go, yeah, whatever. You probably are not qualified handball coaches. And I think it's really important to actually always consider the source of the feedback. Is this something I want to take on board? Or is that something that's coming from someone, someone who's either not qualified or where it's not coming from a place of radical candor? I also believe, I was going to ask you questions about this, but every time I ask about feedback, it's going to take an hour and a half. So I'm going to totally move that to after the presentation. And I also believe that it's hugely important to never, ever stop learning. Do you guys like learning? Seriously? You're different from me. I hate it. I hate learning new things because that's when I'm back at the stupid phase. That's when I have the beginner phase. That's when I don't feel competent and when I'm like totally out of my comfort zone. It's really hard. I like what I get at the end, but learning per se, don't like it that much. What are your unlearning? Yes. What are your yes, unlearning is even harder. Still no one ready to admit that they actually don't like learning that much? If I put it that way, yeah. I think it's important, but it is really hard. And one thing that I learned in professional sports is that if you learn, you go 100% in. You are out of your comfort zone, you're trying to learn something new, and there's absolutely no room when you do this, when you're 100% focused, to think about what you look like, what other people think of you, what things you should hide and how you come across. So I think in order to speed up learning and to be good at learning, we need to not even try to look good. 
and put all vanity aside and stop caring what other people think. So my suggestion is just to take, off, take your mind off the outcome and be totally in the moment and have the courage to be ugly and a beginner and not very good at what you're doing. And when you do that, at some point, you're going to outgrow your idols. In sports, you get to a place where you need to take those posters off the wall. Where you realise that the people you were looking up to, they are actually not better than you anymore. They're on your team. There's not that much you can learn from them anymore. And that's when you realise that actually you're on your own. You need to stop doing what other people have done before. You need to stop looking for people or for one single person you can learn from. You need to bro uh, broaden your spectrum and learn from everyone, but follow absolutely no one. And I think in an agile world, in agile companies, we have an advantage because we say, fail early, fail often. So we are all trying to get better at the mindset to put ourselves out there and fail. Something that annoys me very often, though, is that people seem to go, oh, yeah, failed, didn't work out, not a big deal. I think we need to fail, off, fail often and early, but give a shit. In professional sports, you try something and it doesn't work out, you actually feel quite devastated. You have an emotional connection. The number of times I just wanted to dig a hole or a tunnel to get out of the court without being seen is huge. And that emotional connection to making mistakes has helped me improve even more because then it was even more important and I worked harder on fixing those mistakes. In companies, there is, I think, we're actually getting quite good at this. This is a company where I currently work. We have a concept called trial balloons. It means everything goes and uh, you can try something. And when you try something, you put something, you put the sticky note in a trial balloon. And some of those ideas are going to fly. And some of them are going to die and they go on a fail wall. So what I'd like to say is to just keep evolving. There's never a point where you can actually have a standstill because as soon as you do, you will almost regress compared to everyone else. And if you keep doing this, if you do all these things, if you uh, pick a good team, if you learn from the right people, and if you push yourself, then what's going to happen is that you have a chance to be really deliberate about your career. And in order to be deliberate about your career, to try something and to fail, you need to be able to do this safely. And I've always had a safety net. Since I was a junior PLSQL developer 15 years ago, I've had two months worth of salary on a bank account that I didn't touch ever. It's my runaway money. It's when I'm in a company doing a job that I don't like or realize I'm not learning anymore. I've outgrown this company. I need to leave. I know that I don't need to worry about quitting my job. I can do this and safely assume within two months I can find another job. Is that something that also holds true here or what's the market like here? Yep. Yeah? Contingency, yep. Yes. Yeah, I call it my bugger off money. But contingency money is probably a more proper term. <laughs> Should have thought of that. And what that does is that I know whenever there's something that feels risky and exciting and I feel I can learn, I know I'm totally in the right place and I can make a good judgment call because I don't have to worry about endangering my life or not having any food on the table. So I believe doing all this will get you to a really, really good place. People will want to work with you, and that's how you get the really good gigs. And you will have the emotional agility to be really good at what you're doing and to get a really good career that's satisfying. Sports 
has certainly made me who I am today. I have absolutely no regrets and I'm happy that I have learned a lot. And at least it has also prevented me from becoming an Austrian fashion model in Lederhosen, which I think is good for the world. So just to sum up, here are my tips to be world class. Pick your team wisely, know when to go, collaboration is hard but it's key. Be good at feedback, never stop learning and be deliberate about your career. I'm about to say thank you. Thank you. No one has made this sign yet, so I believe we have some time for questions. So my question, is, my question is two parts. One is, do you find yourself longing to kind of try and recreate that or in a bit of a withdrawal and knowing that like it's very difficult to get there again? And two, Can does I that... You? Yeah. Because I'm really good when people ask two questions okay. that I forget the second one. Okay. Can yeah. I answer the first one you ask? Yeah. Next. Cool. Uh, yes, totally. It's what I miss all the time. Once you have been on that level, you miss it because it's amazing but I also know how much work there's involved in doing this. And it's one of the reasons why I do public speaking. It's very similar, it's the closest I can get, because it's real time. Nobody cares if I can deliver this talk tomorrow or the day before. And it's something where um, you're a bit there, doing something right now, right here, in front of people, which is cool. And there's some element of mastery that you can achieve, and I know I'm nowhere near an Olympic level of doing speaking, but it's the fun being kind of a beginner or intermediate person again. Sorry. Thank you. This, the second part to that was working with people who haven't experienced, who don't know what that feels like. Uh, does that make it difficult to relate sometimes to that you're, you're, you're striving for this and they, they have no idea of that this, this feeling exists or what, that, what that's like? Is that kind of strain relationships at times? Yes. Yes, I've, I think like any experience, this has been, this is my story, this has been normal to me. So empathizing with people who have never ever done this is hard and I'm trying hard to do this and I'm trying to find ways to relate to them what real, really good teamwork could be like, what mastery could be like, and what it could feel like. And sometimes I manage to move them a bit in conversations and through working with them in a team. Sometimes we're just so on different planets that I don't manage to do that. So uh, how did you make this transition from, uh, I mean, how did, like, from an Olympian to software developer in Asia. Yeah. How, did okay. How did I make the transition from Olympian to software developer? First of all, what happens is old age. <laughs> At some point, you get a stop. And I've seen many athletes who turn 35 and they have to stop and they work in a pizza shop. And there's nothing wrong with working in a pizza shop if that's what you love doing. But they didn't. So I knew I needed to do something to make sure that I wouldn't end up like this. So I just decided to stop age 26 and I went to uni and I did a master's degree in computational linguistics and um, got out in the year 2000, didn't know what I didn't know, so I told everyone I was amazing, they should give me a job. And then I learned on the job. Awesome. Thanks. Another question that I had was, uh, so you know, e even I have, uh, uh, when I worked on my team, I use a lot of sports analogies to, you know, motivate the team and, you know, try to draw parallels. But ultimately, you've actually been, you know, on the ground. How, how similar or different? Do you really think that, you know, we, we draw some sports analogies, but ultimately, do you really think that they're sp software development and playing professional sports, do, are they really that similar that we try to, you know, sometimes tell our teams? 
think in some aspects they are, in others they're not. And the things that I was just talking about, they were the ones I experienced are the same and have been the same for me in software development teams as in handball. And there is a gazillion things that are totally different, but those are the things that I think are a, com are a commonality and where to me it's not an anal analogy, but actually the same thing, just applied in different contexts. Thanks. Any other questions? So, so it's a kind of uh, continuing the follow I mean, earlier question. Uh, while we draw, you know, analogies between professional sports and software development, I mean, there's one one slide in your presentation where you said about fail early and fail fast. But I mean, I was all thinking that in professional sports is failing an option because you lose one match, you're out of the entire mm -hmm. thing, right? I mean, it's always right the first time and every game has to be your A game. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we, I mean, uh, at least that was, that was my understanding that we don't have that option of failing in, in professional sports. So I believe we do and I think it's how you define failure and I don't particularly like how we use the word failure because to me it sounds catastrophic. If you replace it with making mistakes, you make a gazillion mistakes on a handball field. I made a gazillion mistakes that I know about doing this presentation. We all do that all the time, but none of those are endangering the whole thing. So I can make mistakes and I will make mistakes on the field and we can still win the game. And sometimes you make mistakes that are so big that you actually lose the game, but life doesn't end there are more games. You might still make the next round in a tournament. And even if it's the Olympics, okay, it's really bad failure. Four years later, there'll be another Olympic Games. Yeah, so uh, it's a kind of extension of what you just said. So what do you do to recover from that? Like logically, you know there are more games, but when you have a really bad day, you're completely down and you feel you don't want to ever do this again. So what do you tell yourself in that situation and how do you get back to normal and play the next game? That's a really good question because it is quite horrible when that happen and it happens and what worked for me is the going away, going all in, feeling I am the worst player in the world, I should not play handball, I'm never going to amount to anything at all. Go through that and that might last max a day and then having a rule with myself then I really need to get myself together and just look forward. Is there anything I can learn about this from what I've done? Yes, cool, apply it. If not, just move on. But after a day, just move on and look forward. Um, <coughs> sorry, I had a question. Not question actually, um, just a confirmation so as to speak. So be it this professional sport or be it a software development or, or any aspect of any professional life, <coughs> Are we talking about uh, the underlying um, human interactions and human principles and the behaviors? Uh, and then we are trying to tune that up to a certain level uh, so that uh, regardless of the profession that you choose, uh, those underlying factors are always present in you. Uh, is, is my understanding or correct in, in that way? I don't know if it's correct or not, but I would agree. Anyone? Take a last question. How important do you think is the role of the coach? Because in many of the software teams, there is actually no coach. Mm -hmm. But in a, soft, yeah. in a professional sport, there is always a coach, even though the <coughs> excuse me, the players are uh, yeah. already pros. Mm -hmm. So can you draw yeah. an analogy, I mean, a yeah. uh, parallel between? Yeah. So role of the coach in software development versus professional sports. I think there's a huge difference there. That's one of the huge differences. In professional sports, you always have a coach and you practice. And I think that's one of the places where our, any analogy probably falls down. In software development, we need to learn from other people. And that can be, well, or it can be a coach, it can be uh, any other people you work with, it can be books. It can be more informal, and uh, very often you don't just have a coach, but many people you learn from. Is, and I think sometimes, like, I'm an agile coach, as I call it, but basically it's being around and helping people learn something. Some of it is coaching, some of it is just having conversations, and I think 
being a professional on a team. It can be useful to have a coach, but I think there are also really good teams, software development teams, who don't have a coach. If that makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Thank you.